Acts 17, starting in verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So Paul and Silas are continuing on their journey uh, to share the gospel everywhere they go, and they come upon this place called Thessalonica, and it's really interesting what happens there. I, I wonder, have you ever wondered what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? You know, we talk about citizenship a lot when it comes to uh, being American. We talk about voting, we talk about rights, we talk about all these kind of things, but when it comes to being a citizen of heaven, what does that really mean? What does that look like? Well, Paul and Silas here kind of demonstrate what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. And our real main point for today is that citizens of God's kingdom live in such a way that we proclaim the gospel in everything that we do, whether it be actually preaching the gospel or whether it is in how we live. So look with me at verses 1 through 3. It says, now when they passed through Amphipolis in Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So a little bit of geography for us. Do we have that map that we can pull up? So a little bit of geography here. So they're up here at this top left corner, Amphipolis, Apollonia. And you can see that Thessalonica is basically the next city in line. Basically, what they're doing is they're following a passage, uh, a trade route, uh, that fell between two different rivers uh, called the Ignatian Way. And they stop in Thessalonica, one, because it's a pretty big city. It's about 200,000 people, so about 25% more than Abilene is today, uh, which is kind of sad. <laughs> but So Abilene's real small, y'all. Uh, so 200,000 people, and it says that there was a synagogue there. Now, why would there be a synagogue in Thessalonica. Well, it wasn't really uh, a big hub of, of Jewish people, but Paul and Silas are traveling right around the time when all of the Jews get kicked out of Rome. And there was a huge number of Jewish people living in the city of Rome. And when they got kicked out, they spread across all uh, of the Roman Empire. And there was a rule that where there were uh, ten or more Jewish men living in the same city that they had to have a synagogue. And so that's what happened here. There's a synagogue in Thessalonica because these Jews have been kicked out and they're going into, uh, they're, they're forming new communities. So Paul and Silas do what they always do, verse 2. They go in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So it says, as was his custom, Paul knew where he would find uh, natural places to have gospel conversations. And you know, you and I can do the same thing. You know, for Paul, it's pretty easy because he knew where the Jewish people were. Like, you just go to their church, you show up, and you start talking about Jesus. But you and I actually have those opportunities every single day as we're doing our lives we can practice what's called incarnational living. We can become a regular at your favorite coffee shop and strike up a conversation with your barista. You can get to know your barber 
and start up conversations. You become a known entity at the places you frequent, and then you have the opportunity to then strike up conversations with people. And this is a natural way for us to share the gospel. You and I don't have to go out on mission in a different country or do something strange out of our normal day-to-day life to live on mission. You actually can live with gospel intentionality in your everyday life. Even if you're a stay-at-home mom or if you don't interact with a lot of people because of your job or whatever it is, you have opportunities every single day to live with gospel intentionality and, and you can be intentional in how you speak with people that you interact with all the time. And so that's what Paul's doing. He's following that normal pattern as was his custom. And on three different Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, verse 3, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Have you ever been asked by somebody why Jesus had to die? I mean, think about it. Some guy, even if he was perfect, lived 2,000 years ago, and he's killed on a Roman cross, and he rises from the dead, but what does that have to do with you? Why did Jesus actually have to die? Well, Paul begins to explain this here, and first, look what, what, how he does it. He starts by reasoning with them from the scriptures. Paul is dealing with people who have a background in the Old Testament, right? Like, we've talked multiple times about how Jewish people lived and breathed the Old Testament, right? To be a Pharisee, you had to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy verbatim, right? I can't do that. That's pretty intense, right? They had to have that memorized. They knew what the Bible said. So he starts from a place where they understand, starting from the scriptures. And notice that Paul isn't relying on his skills in speaking. He's relying uh, on the word of God. He's not relying on his ability to argue well. He's relying on the Holy Spirit to change their hardened hearts. He starts from a place where he would have common ground with his audience And then he shares the gospel from that starting point. And listen, not everyone has the same starting point. We live in a society now where we cannot assume that people have a biblical background. This is so sad. I met someone the other day. I was at a gas station. um, Where was it? South 27th and I want to say it's not Treadway. The one right before that, Buffalo Gap, sales. There's a gas station right there at the corner. Uh, where Mr. Gaddy's is, and I walk in, I start talking to the guy, and I, I mention um, that I'm a pastor and all this kind of stuff, and he's like, oh, cool, I've never met a pastor before in Abilene. <laughs> he's, never had a, he's never met a pastor. He knew absolutely nothing about Christianity, and y'all, he lived here. We can't assume that just because there's a lot of churches that people know who Jesus is. In fact, when we did our last... Uh, demographic study here in Abilene, what we found was that uh, about 60% of people in Abilene identify as Christian, and about 20% of that 60% we would identify as actual Christians, and not just in name only or because they were born into it, but actually born again, loving Jesus Christians. We actually have a huge population in Abilene of people that don't know Jesus and really don't have a background in it, other than maybe what they see on Christmas, sometimes on Easter. And Paul is functioning in that same scenario. Here, he's dealing with people who have a biblical background, but we're going to see at the end of chapter 17, when he goes to Athens, he he deals with people who know absolutely nothing about the scriptures. And he starts from a different perspective. So Paul doesn't even bring up the scriptures in Athens, but here he does. And he argues that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. Now, that would have been a big stumbling block for the Jewish people there. The Jews had an expectation of what the Messiah was going to be like. They believed, based on their interpretation of Scripture, what they've been taught by their rabbis, that the Messiah who came was going to be a political king. And that when the Messiah showed up, he would raise an army, defeat Rome, and reestablish the kingdom of Israel. And then that kingdom 
would reign forever and ever in the world. They thought of it as a political Messiah, as, a, as, a, as someone coming in, rebelling against Rome, creating this revolution, and reestablishing the nation of Israel. What's interesting is that the Bible actually says that in the New Testament, that Jesus, when he comes back the second time, he's going to come as this lion. He's going to destroy all of his enemies, and he is going to establish his kingdom. So they're kind of right, but they got the timing wrong. Because what they forgot was that before that could happen, the Scripture said that the Messiah would have to suffer and die. See, Jesus established a different kind of kingdom. A kingdom that conquers its enemies, but does it by transforming them into citizens of that kingdom. Jesus had to suffer and die because he was dealing with a bigger problem than just political power. He was dealing with the power of sin, living in the heart of every human being and destroying the power of Satan over the world. And listen, this is why we share the gospel. That's why everything that we do is centered around the gospel. Because every single one of us has this problem and Jesus has done something about it and we need to share that news. This is why Paul is compelled to go on these journeys despite beatings and imprisonment and death threats. And we could just go on and on about all the things that happened to him, right? We haven't even got to the bar where he gets shipwrecked multiple times, gets bit by deadly snakes. We have a problem, and it's called sin, and it separates us from God. But not only that, sin at its core is rebellion against God, who is the king of the universe. See, the fact is, our sins deserve the death penalty. And for us to be right with God, something has to be done about the death sentence placed on us. And you might be sitting there asking, well, why can't God just forgive everybody? Why does Jesus actually have to die? Why couldn't God, if he's really all-powerful, if he's really able to do whatever he wants, why cannot God simply erase all of the sin of the world? Why does he seem, as atheists put it, to commit spiritual child abuse and send his own son to die in our place? To ask those questions is really to misunderstand who God is. Jesus had to die because if he forgave everyone, he would not be just and therefore not God. Think about this. A murderer comes into your house and he kills your entire family but you. That should upset you. And and then they, they, they find the murderer and then they bring him to court And you get to court and the judge says, listen, I'm going to have mercy on you and I'm just going to set you free. Are you satisfied with that? I would hope not. I I would hope that in that moment you would be furiously angry because justice had not been done. See, we're all wired to want justice. We're wired by God to, to want justice because we're made in God's image. God cannot just forgive everyone because he cares much more about sin than we do. He cares much more about the effects that it has on people than you and I do. So to forgive everyone and not punish sin would mean that he's not just and that he's not God. Scripture says that he is perfectly just. So for him to not forgive means that he's not God. Or for him to forgive fully. So sin has to be dealt with. That penalty has to be paid. And listen, not just anyone can pay that penalty. The reason Jesus himself had to die is because we can't just take some person who's like, hey guys, I'll do it, and put all our sins on him. See, if someone wants to pay off everyone else's debt, they would need sufficient funds to do so, right? Like if somebody took your debt, they took all of it onto themselves, and they said, I'm going to pay this off, you would then assume that they have enough money to do that, right? And if they do that, they're, they're able to prove that they're able to pay it off by actually paying it off. Well, if we take that metaphor into what we're talking about with sin and the cross, 
the only way someone could have sufficient righteousness to pay off that sin debt that you and I have, and really the sins of the entire world is, that person has to be perfect. That person has to have no stain of sin. Listen, you can't pay off somebody else's debt if you yourself are in debt, right? doesn't make sense. You can't do it like that. Only a sinless person could have enough righteousness to pay that debt. So what Paul is arguing is he's saying, listen, Jesus had to die because he's the only one who could. And he uses the Old Testament to do it, and he most likely used passages like this out of Isaiah 53. I'm just going to read a couple of passages out of it. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom made men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Skipping down to verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Paul would have used passages like this to show that the Old Testament, the thing that they all hold to, the thing that they study and held dear, talked about a Messiah who was not only a political Messiah, but one who would suffer and die and bear our sins in his body. Someone who would exchange his life for ours. And Paul's saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. This man, Jesus, lived and died and rose again, and he is the one that those scriptures are talking about. Jesus is the one who has done this, and he proved it by rising from the dead. Think about this again. Somebody says he's going to take on all of your debt. Like somebody says they want to take on the entire debt of the world. Would that be proof enough if they just said that? No, we would want proof. We would want the receipts, right? We want to show that the debt has actually been paid. So somebody's like, hey, yeah, I'll take on all your debt, and then they file for bankruptcy. Is that helpful? No, it's, it's not going to show that they've been paid for. In fact, it would show that he'd been beaten by the debt. But what Jesus shows by his resurrection from the dead is that he had conquered death. He had conquered the power of sin and its implications and now has risen to reign in life with us. So Jesus had to die. And this is the gospel that Paul is proclaiming to them. And look at what happens here in verse 4 and 5. Whenever the gospel is proclaimed, it elicits a response. And before we get in there, listen, there, there is no neutrality when it comes to the gospel. We're either going to respond in grateful acceptance or with willful rejection. There is no neutral. There is no middle ground. And we see that exactly happening in this passage. Verse 4, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. So it says that they were persuaded to join Paul and Silas. Listen, Christianity is not a blind faith. When I talk to people who don't know Jesus, sometimes I, I hear that. that they, they say, well, that faith is blind. You just have to take everything that Christianity says on faith. There's no proof. And they're normally talking about proof of the existence of God or something like that. But listen, the scriptures are very clear regarding who Jesus is and of the salvation that he provides for us. There's actually a doc, if you want to learn a big word today, there's actually the doctrine called the perspicuity of scripture, which is just a big word that says the clarity of scripture, that the Bible is very clear when it comes to salvation. It's very clear when it comes to who God is, what he's done, what he's accomplished for us in his revealed will. 
Commentator Albert Muller says it like this, faith must not be seen as jumping off a cliff, in other words, blind faith. Instead, we must come to understand by God's grace the truth claims of the scriptures and place our faith in the well-reasoned, well-articulated power of the gospel. See, the gospel itself is powerful, not just in its message, but in its truth, in its clarity. There is no system, there is no belief, there is no argument that can overcome the truth claims of Christianity, and you and I can hold on to that. When we have the scriptures and we have God's revealed will, we can see the truth of the gospel, and there's nothing that can come against that. We have an irrefutable revelation from God. And it says that Jews, Greeks, and leading women all believe. So uh, just for clarity's sake, that there was Jewish people in the synagogue, some, maybe some Jewish leaders who believed. These Greeks who are probably God-fearers, who are not circumcised Jews, but are uh, worshiping the God of the Jews, and then leading women. Um, there were women uh, in society at this time who had uh, power, which is something um, that's, that's very akin to today. So they, they had much influence in the city. So people from all different walks of life, all different uh, states are believing in the gospel. But look at then what happens in verse 5. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men from the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. So when it says the Jews there, what it's really saying is that the Jewish leaders, it's not just like the Jews in general. Some people have taken that um, and misinterpreted that scripture, and they use it as an argument against Jewish people in general is anti-Semitism. But that's not what this is saying. It's talking about the Jewish leaders in the synagogue. And it says that they're jealous. Why are they jealous? Well, they're jealous because they wanted the acclaim. They wanted the position and the honor that Paul and Silas were receiving. They wanted to receive this big response like they had gotten. They wanted the acclaim and the authority that they were receiving. And we've said this before, but the fact that they're jealous, it's not just because they want the authority or they want the acclaim, it's because they're worshiping something other than God. And that sounds weird hearing, uh, coming from a, a Jewish leader in a synagogue, you might be like, well, how are they worshiping someone else other than God? Well, really, jealousy and really all sin is rooted in idolatry. See, the gospel confronts us with the truth that Jesus alone is to be worshipped. And when we reject that, what our heart is really doing with the gospel is it's choosing to worship something else instead. For them, they were worshipping power. They were worshipping authority. They were worshipping claim. And because they valued that above the message of the gospel, they rebelled against it. Listen, you and I do the same thing. You and I, when we deal with problems with power or independence or, or, or self-sufficiency or, or we value comfort above God or money or security or our entertainment, what we're really doing is we're putting something in the place of God that we think is going to give us more joy, more love, more satisfaction than God himself will. We're really saying that we know what is good and right for us if we value this thing over what God wants. And listen, you can check your heart on this. If you want to know whether you have an idol or something, ask yourself what you would feel or how it would be like for it to be taken away from you. And if that response is worse than if Jesus was taken away, then you know that you have an idol. You know you're worshiping something more than God. The gospel is rejected because it proclaims that Jesus is king. And so often we just want to rule ourselves. We want to be our own little kings in our own little universe. Like children sitting in the throne of a king, pretending to be rulers when we can't do anything 
at all. That's why they form this mob, because they're running in idolatry. They not only reject the gospel, but they seek to destroy those who proclaim it. It's not enough for them to disagree with them. They seek to silence their opponents. That sounds a lot like Twitter, doesn't it? (laughs) I don't know if you've been on the social medias lately. It's toxic. Just don't go. (laughs) It's it's real bad. Uh, Because this is kind of our our culture now. It's really interesting that the the kind of culture that we're living in right now, um, some commentators have said that it's probably the closest to the culture that we're reading about here that we've been in a long time. That we're, we're probably closest to Roman culture now than we have been in a, in a long time. And we see cancel culture happening in our, our society. You say one wrong thing on Twitter and people want you to lose your job. They want to cancel you for whatever reason. So we're not living through anything new. And this often happens when when we proclaim the gospel. Listen, when you faithfully live out the call to to share the gospel with people, you're going to get resistance. Whenever the gospel goes someplace, the enemy wants to attack and wants it to stop. And so we're not living through anything new, and the disciples saw this happening as well. So they go to the house of a man called Jason, And when they try to find the apostles, they're not there, so they drag Jason out instead. Now, who is Jason? Well, Jason is probably a wealthy guy with a big house that can hold some people. And he's most likely the sponsor of uh, Paul and Silas while they're in the city. So what that means is he's probably taking care of their needs. He's probably paying for some of their stuff. He's being their host. He's doing all these kinds of things. Um, and because he is their sponsor, he is then also responsible for what they do in the city. You know, like, I have a three-year-old, right? And when my three-year-old does something really dumb, I'm the one that's responsible. Why? Because I'm in charge of my child, right? He's under my house. He's in my authority. And so it's kind of like that. So he's most likely a well-off man. He's using his home uh, to house the apostles. And he's serving the church. And listen, we can learn a lot from Jason. You know, often when we read passages like this, we're really focused on Paul. We're really focused on the people he's traveling with. And the other people are kind of just seen as side characters. But sometimes we forget that these were real people with real lives who really sought to further the kingdom of God. Because of Jason's faithful servants or service, the gospel was advanced. And the spotlight wasn't on him, but what he did was no less important. And listen, you may not receive much attention for what you do for Jesus in this life. In fact, if we live faithfully, it's it's kind of likely that we're going to receive a lot of grief for living faithfully to Jesus. You may not get the spotlight, you may not get to be on the news, or you may not get to be in front of a, a huge number of people, but God wants to use you. God has a purpose for you in your life. And and lives will be changed because you choose to faithfully and courageously live according to the gospel in your everyday life. Don't think that just because you are not a pastor or a missionary that God has no purpose for you. He has sovereignly placed you exactly where you are in your life so that you might be a witness to those around you. God has put you exactly where you are. And listen, sometimes that's hard, right? Because sometimes we really don't like the situations we're in, right? Sometimes we really don't like the job that we have. Sometimes we really don't like the the circles that we interact with. And yet God has placed you there so that you might be a witness in a dark place. Sometimes God puts you in situations because he's using you to share the gospel with, with people that no one else could reach. Listen, you are going to reach people in your life that I will never meet. You are going to reach people in your life for Jesus when you faithfully live out the gospel that pastors and missionaries and all these other people might never interact with because of the circles that we run in. And yet God has sent you. You are placed exactly where you are to be a witness. Don't ever think that because you're not getting acclaim, because you're not in the spotlight, 
that God is using you less. He has a purpose for you, and he's placed you exactly where he wants you to be, just like Jason was. I, I bet that Jason, if we told him that he was going to be in the Bible for just hosting Paul and Silas, would have been astounded. Because it seems so small. And yet, because of his actions, the gospel was put forward. Sometimes we don't know how big the actions that we're taking are. You know, sometimes it can be as small as a smile or a handshake and a wave, saying hello to somebody. I remember reading a story not too long ago of somebody who was dealing with suicidal thoughts. And they were actually on their way to end their life when somebody said hello to them. They smiled and waved. And that's it. But because they got that one interaction, they felt cared about enough to where they wouldn't end their life. Sometimes we don't know how big of an impact the small things that we do for Jesus are. Sometimes just telling someone that Jesus loves them is huge because we have no idea what's going on. You know, we can see some of what is happening in people's lives, but when we get down deep, we, we don't see a lot. Sometimes people are going through things that we will never know, and yet God has put us in those situations so that we might be a faithful witness to Jesus. So this mob takes Jason and the other Christians who are meeting in his house, verse 6, and then when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So they have three charges that they lay against these Christians. First is that the Christians are turning the world upside down. The Christians are being hospitable to Paul and Silas. And these Christians are proclaiming the rule of another king named Jesus. And I hope that every person in this room would say, yes, amen, guilty as charged. Right? They hit the nail on the head. This is exactly what we proclaim. That mob could not be more correct. We proclaim a kingdom with values that are completely opposite of the world. Just go read the Sermon on the Mount sometime. The values that Jesus puts forth are completely opposite to the values of the time. We proclaim loving our enemies rather than hating them, which is kind of hard in a polarized society. Can you imagine if our society chose to love their enemies instead of trying to cancel them on Twitter? Right? It would be completely different, and yet because we live in the kingdom of God, we love our enemies. We value mercy and meekness over domination and power. We value being peacemakers rather than violent, finding salvation through a crucified Savior rather than our own efforts, caring for the weak and the fatherless and the widows instead of taking advantage of them. And we could go on and on. And the kingdom of God is completely upside down, and the gospel is what makes that happen. As hearts are transformed from hardened rebels to joyful citizens of the kingdom, the effects spread to every sphere of influence, every institution, every level of government. Listen, it was Christians who invented colleges. It was Christians who made hospitals, right? These wouldn't exist if not for the gospel. God has done this and because he transforms hearts, it radiates out into every part of our society. That's why our name is Resonate Community Church. The definition of the word resonate is to be filled with a sound that then moves out into its environment. That's a picture of the gospel, right? As the gospel indwells our hearts, it then moves out into its environment and it changes things. And that's what's happening here. The kingdom of God does turn the world upside down. But not just that. We love and we serve other believers so that the cause of the gospel might expand. And listen, we're, right now we're living in, in that hospitality, right? We're here because the elders of Southside said, hey, we love you, we want to support you, we want to see the gospel move forward in Abilene, and we want to give you a place to meet, right? It's beautiful hospitality, they're caring for us and they're loving for us when we didn't ask them to be so generous, and yet they are. And listen, my prayer is, is that we would not only do this for one another within our church, 
but that we would have opportunities to help other believers in Abilene and all around the world so that the gospel can go forth. That's why our vision as a church is to be a church that's planting churches. We want to raise up teams of people and send them all over the world to advance the cause of Christ. We want to do that not just because it's cool, because it's super cool. Yes, I know Siri didn't get that. It's cool, but also because we care about the gospel. We care about loving and serving believers and helping them to share the gospel where God has called them to go. And we do proclaim that Jesus really is that King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That he, that is not to say, though, that we reject the authority of our government, but that our loyalties lay with Christ. And, you know, sometimes the government might ask us to do something that isn't lined up with what Jesus calls us to do. And in those moments, our call is to be faithful to Christ as citizens of his kingdom and to not obey those things and choose to follow Jesus instead. But that doesn't mean that we fully reject every part of our government, right? We're not the people with the tinfoil hat saying, they're coming for us, like, we got to get... Like, no, we're not starting a rebellion. Instead, God's kingdom is subversive. In other words, Jesus conquers his enemies. He takes over the world, but he does it not through force, but through the power of the cross. You and I, as we live every day as citizens of the kingdom... When we choose to love our enemies, and we choose to live intentionally, trying to have gospel conversations with people, and living for God's glory and his kingdom, that changes things. Sometimes it's the small things that create big results. You ever watch one of those cartoons where there is a rock that starts falling down a snowy hill, and then what happens at the end, it's a giant snowball. Why? Because it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes down the hill. And it's funny, right? Because the, the character runs and they eventually get flattened by it. But Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like that too. He said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, super small. And yet when it's planted, a tree grows up and all kinds of animals come and live inside it. That's a picture of God's kingdom. It starts out small. It seems so insignificant and yet it creates these massive changes. And our call as, as citizens of that kingdom is to live faithfully. And day in and day out, seeing those small seeds planted so that God's kingdom can expand. So it says, verse 8, And the people of the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, but obviously not too disturbed because, verse 9, when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So they got off with a fine. It's pretty great. But as we'll see, the threat of violence doesn't stop. And looking ahead, the disciples take off and they head to Berea because they know more opposition is coming. So what do we do with all this? Well, first off, if you're not a believer in here today, if, you, if you're not sure that you are a follower of Jesus, listen, your life can be transformed today. Jesus has paid the penalty for your sins, and he offers you that salvation freely. You can be freed today of all of your guilt, all of your shame, all of your past. You can be free from everything when you put your faith in Jesus, when you simply trust him that what he did is effective toward you. You put your trust in him like you put your trust in a parachute, Today is the day that you can be free from those things. And listen, if you're a Christian and you're in here and you're struggling with some of that, maybe you've been walking in, in shame and guilt because you've been struggling with this sin that you can't seem to get over. You, you feel like God doesn't love you because you're struggling with this. Listen, that's a lie. Jesus paid for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. And today, you can be free from all of those things simply turning to him and trusting him. You can have all of it taken away and live in the freedom and the life and the joy that Jesus brings. Not because you're somehow better, not because you earned it, but because Jesus earned it for you. Because he died for you on the cross. 
Today is the day that you can be free from those things. So today, choose to turn to him and trust him and find freedom. And finally, if you are a follower of Jesus in here, our job as Christians is to faithfully live as citizens of the kingdom of God and to proclaim that Jesus is king with our words and our actions and everything that we do. So listen, here's a practical way that we can start. Start where you are. You don't have to go, again, you don't have to go somewhere to be a missionary. You don't have to go somewhere to live intentionally for the gospel. Start where you are. Start at work. Start at your family. Start with the people that you already talk to with all the time. Find natural places to have those gospel conversations. Those conversations comes up not when someone suddenly asks, hey, can you tell me about Jesus? Though that would be awesome. It happens when we live intentionally looking to bring Jesus up with the people that we already talked to. And second, pray for boldness. One of the reasons that we don't live faithfully for Jesus often is because we're fear. We're afraid of what people are going to say. We're afraid of what they're going to do. We're afraid of how people are going to react. So pray for boldness, that God will give you the words to say and that he would help you speak. And third, proclaim the gospel. You and I have to sit to speak the word of the gospel to people. Listen, it's not enough just to be a nice person to everyone. Some people want to advocate for that, saying that, you know, you can share the gospel with people and never actually tell them the gospel. No, we need to have those gospel conversations with people. So pray for boldness and then share the word. And it can be simple as Jesus died for you. And he transformed my life. Let me tell you how he did that and how you can have that transformation too. It doesn't have to be hard. And God calls us to live faithfully as people of his kingdom. If we're going to carry forth the Great Commission, we have to do so. And it can start right where you are today. So let's go live on mission. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the power of the gospel. I thank you for its transforming effects on us. God, thank you for taking our hardened hearts and softening them. Father, every one of us has failed to live fully as a citizen of the kingdom, even this week. So Father, would you help us? Father, where sins need to be repented of, would you help us to repent? where grief and guilt and shame need to be laid down, would you help us to do that? Father, would you help us to find freedom today in the finished work of what you did for us on the cross? Not in our own actions or abilities or our strivings, but simply in what you have done for us. And help us to faithfully proclaim that. So, Father, now in these next moments, would you help us to confess to you? Jesus, your word says that when we confess our sins to you, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Father, now having confessed our sins, help us to leave them at your feet. Father, fill us with joy, the joy of our salvation and the assurance that the cross brings to us. And help us now rise and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.